Greetings. My name is Tim McDermott. I'm an OSU Extension educator in Franklin County, and today we are going to be talking about ticks with a 2021 update on ticks, diseases, and prevention strategies here in Ohio. So a few fast facts about ticks. They vector or transmit a number of different diseases, bacterial, viral, protozoal, as well as an allergic syndrome. And what we're finding is we find out new things about ticks every day. We, um, we get new research findings. We have ticks expanding into different host ranges. We have new invasive ticks. And um, it's almost tough to keep up on all the changes that we have. There's a couple different kinds of ticks. There's hard shell and soft shell ticks. We're going to be talking about the hard shell ticks today, the ones that are medically important to humans, companion animals, and livestock. One other thing about ticks is they're not insects, they're actually arachnids. Um, they are in their adult form. They have their eight legs, four pairs. And what this uh, is important is when we talk about their questing behavior, which is how they hunt. And what that means is they hunt by attaching to vegetation with their back pair legs, and then they quest or they sense and, and grasp prey as it moves past with their front two pair of legs, where they then walk up their prey to find their preferred feeding spots where they they can start the feeding process. And so when I'm talking about ticks, one of the things that I've started to do a lot more is directly addressing some of the myths that we have about ticks because there's several myths that are out there. One myth is that ticks are only active in summer. And um, what we're finding is ticks can be active all throughout the year. Now they might be overrepresented in certain seasons because of temperature or humidity, but most ticks take years to complete their life cycle and they can go into diapause or, or pause their feeding when there is no food or conditions are not right for that. So they can be around for a long time. And when the weather improves, they can, um, they can break that and then they can go looking for something to eat. Myth number two is ticks prefer the woods. And while there are some tick varieties that do per, um, prefer the wood species such as the lone star tick or the deer tick. There are a number of ticks that actually do better out in sort of pasture, open grassland, can tolerate a little more sunshine, a little bit drier conditions. Things like the American dog tick or the Gulf Coast tick are ticks that prefer that more open habitat. And then another myth is that it takes a full day to transmit disease. And, and this is based on data for Lyme disease transmission in black-legged or deer ticks from the CDC. But research is increasingly finding that it really is variable and it depends not only on the tick, but the life stage that tick is in and what disease we're talking about. And so there are um, instances where we might have a much faster transmission depending on the disease, the tick, the life stage. So here is an example of a life cycle, and this is the deer tick from the CDC. And, and ticks, basically, they um, they hatch from an egg. The first stage they go is to a larval stage. Commonly, that only has six legs, three pairs on there. Then it moves into its nymphal stage where they get that extra pair of legs. They're feeding on hosts of different sizes as they mature. The larval stage and even the nymph stage are going to feed on some of the smaller mammals. Then they're going to feed on larger mammals as they mature. And after they have a nymphal stage, then they're going to mature into their adult stage. And they're, um, they're going to take, depending on the tick species, uh, deer ticks can take two years. You can have ones that take longer than that. So I touched on disease transmission earlier. And like I said, there are different attachment times and then you, uh, and for transmission, depending on the disease. And a lot of what we have is based on that Lyme disease from the CDC. And what they found is generally you needed attachment for 24 hours. And then you had this linear progression that assuming that there was disease in the tick, that the longer that it fed, there was a greater chance of transmission over time. Um, we have seen, at least in the laboratory, that we're, we're seeing some differences depending on the disease, like anaplasmosis might take less than that. And experimentally, Powassan virus has been transmitted to mice is in as little as 15 minutes from nymphal deer ticks. And um, they're even finding new things out about Rocky Mountain spotted fever, where if it exists in the salivary glands of ticks that immediately after they attach using that hypostome in this picture right here, this thing that looks like a, a giant harpoon with lots of blades on it. 
once they attach and they start to secrete substances into their host, things that are anticoagulants, things that are uh, sort of like an analgesic, so you don't feel the attachment, um, glue to keep them on there, once they start to get really, really big, that you might have a, a much more rapid than 24 hour transmission of disease from the tick vectored into the host. So, like I said, we're going to talk about the medical disease of consequence ticks in Ohio, and, and those right now are the American dog tick, the black-legged tick, the Lone Star tick, and the Gulf Coast tick, and the Longhorn tick, and those are the ones that we have in Ohio right now. For 20 years, when you look 20 years ago, what we had was only the American dog tick, and then we started to see the black-legged tick and the Lone Star tick, and just last year in 2020, we added the Gulf Coast tick with established colonies here in Ohio, and we have now three counties in Ohio that have longhorn tick populations, uh, and that's what we found so far. So in that 20 year time period, we went from one medically important tick in humans, companion animals and livestock, to now we have five. And there's some size variability here. And one of the things I really want you to pay attention to is when they're really tiny, that nymphal stage and that larval stage over here, they are minuscule. That can be very, very difficult to find and, and remove from a host when they're small. Um, and so that can make making sure you stay safe a bit of a challenge that way. So we'll talk about the American dog tick here for a minute. This one's been around for a long time. When I was in private practice in veterinary medicine, this is the one that we encountered when I first got started. Fairly common here in Ohio. This is one that is a more pasture or woodland. Um, this is commonly encountered in a backyard lawn, believe it or not. And this is one that they all like to sort of have their favorite diseases that they vector and the American dog tick is no different than that. But their favorite one that they like to transmit is Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. And here is the established host range for them. And this is, um, this is something I want you to pay close attention to because we're going to take a look at various maps later on. And lots of them look like this, where you have the majority or the eastern half of the United States is a viable host range for a tick. Sometimes you'll have a sprinkling of some coastal area over here because there's some similarities. So the black-legged tick is also known as the deer tick, and this is one we have in many counties here in Ohio, and this is one that has a, a number of different diseases that it vectors, but this is most widely known for vectoring Lyme disease, not only to humans, but dogs can get it, and so can horses. This is one that when we look way back, say 2014, it was not really widespread in Ohio. In fact, at that point, I wasn't really seeing a tremendous amount of that in central Ohio in companion animals in private practice. It has since spread across Ohio. So there's a 2014 um, map from the CDC. And you can see that besides Lyme disease and, and Powassan, which we talked about, there's some other Borrelias and then Anaplasma and Babesia. Now, take a look at our uh, 2019 black legged tick host range map, and you'll notice that at least on the eastern half of the United States, it looks eerily similar to that American dog tick map that we looked at just a few minutes ago. So Lyme disease is a devastating disease, and um, we have uh, concerns that there is some serious uh, percentage of ticks populated in Ohio that carry Lyme disease and potentially then could vector that. When we, um, when we look at the cases, what we're finding from the CDC is we have a recorded number of cases of 30,000, 40,000, but the CDC estimates that we're under reporting by a factor of 10, and that they're guessing that we're closer to 300,000 to 400,000 cases estimated per year of Lyme disease. And on this map, this is 2021. This is showing where we're seeing big cluster of them. The um, black-legged tick or the deer tick does prefer a little bit more wooded habitat. And so you can see that in the portions of Ohio that we have a little bit more woodland, um, we have a little bit more hot spots for the, for the black-legged tick. So the Lone Star tick is one that is coming to Ohio um, on a sort of a similar pattern as the deer tick, but instead of coming more from the east, this is coming more from sort of the southeast. And what it is doing is also spreading its way through that woodland habitat because it is a woodland preferring tick. This is a tick that we see very commonly now in all of the river bend counties on the Ohio River where we have see a lot of pasture, a lot of grazing, 
This one is a tick that heavily prefers the woods. It's an aggressive feeder. It's a more aggressive feeder than a deer tick. This will feed on livestock, companion animals, people. Um, and this one is in pretty heavy numbers down in southern, southeastern and southwestern Ohio. So this was the pattern that we're seeing on this. And, and this tick is actually spread to mostly include this upper Midwest. And so the Lone Star tick is pretty close to establishing a host range map that looks pretty much exact to the eastern half of that American dog tick that we looked at, as well as the deer tick when we compare their host range that they're viable in. So one thing I wanna stress about the Lone Star tick that is um, of consequence to people, while the Lone Star tick does have the various bacterial diseases that it will vector, the Lone Star tick has been implicated in an allergic syndrome. And what that syndrome is, is there are some chemical similarities in the saliva of a Lone Star tick that resemble non-mammalian muscle carbohydrates. And there are um, a number of people that if, if your immune system reacts negatively for a Lone Star tick bite, you can actually become allergic to non-primate mammalian muscle, which means you become allergic to things like beef or pork or lamb or venison. And that is a syndrome that has been um, identified as being most likely in the Lone Star tick, but actually I'm starting to see some research that indicates that there might be some other ticks that, that show the ability to um, have a allergic reaction compromise with uh, a human host when they get bit. So that is a disease if you're like me and, and you enjoy uh, eating your beef or pork or lamb or venison, you do not want to get a Lone Star tick bite. So Gulf Coast tick. Now the Gulf Coast tick has been around in the United States for a very, very long time, but it is new to Ohio now. So it's not an invasive, but what we've had is an extension of the host range to where it is now in Ohio and we have identified uh, established colonies of the Gulf Coast tick, mostly in the southwestern corner of the state, clustered sort of around Cincinnati area. This is a tick that, like I said, it's been wrong for a long time. It has a long history in the United States as being a pest, especially in the livestock industry of first um, identified in 1844. And this is one, its original uh, host range, as you can imagine with the name of the Gulf Coast tick was in the Gulf Coast. So this is sort of down around Texas, Louisiana and, and all of that area down there. They do a lot of grazing down there. And when this tick was, um, was making its presence known heavily in the livestock industry, where it was causing a big problem was, is it has a relatively giant hypostome, that big barbed feeding mouth part that we talked about. And so when it would feed on cattle or small ruminants or any, um, any other mammal, it would leave a fairly sizable wound post feeding. And where that was a huge problem is right around the time of the early 1900s, there was a, another predator pest, an insect pest of livestock, and that was the screw worm, which is the, um, the larval form of a certain type of blowfly. And that blowfly would lay its eggs in that wound. And while most blowfly um, maggots will feed on dead tissue, the screw worm is um, known by its ability to feed on live tissue. So this would burrow into the livestock. And as you can imagine, that would cause uh, tremendous medical implementation, implications as well as tremendous economic loss. So that was identified by the government and they um, made every effort to eradicate the screw worm. And we've had it for the most part eradicated in the United States. We've had occasional outbreaks. There was one around 2017 in the Florida Keys. They got that under control. Um, but we have this now in Ohio. The Gulf Coast tick is here. And this is also a pasture liking one, as you can imagine, from Gulf Coast and, and, and the habitat that they have down there where they're grazing animals. This one has a number of different diseases. It's identified as, as being able to transmit either for sure or in the laboratory in the case of leptospirosis. Um, we worry about it with a canine disease, uh, hepatozoonosis, and then it can transmit a spotted fever that is sort of like uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever, but not as severe, but, but still a medical problem. And that's a Rickettsia parkeri. So this is one we need to watch for. We need to start mapping out where we have it in the state so we can identify this, so we can assist um, veterinarians and producers and human health 
and public health officials so that they know that we need to make sure that we're watching for this and staying protected for this. So here is our Gulf Coast tick from way back in 2010. And as you can see, basically we're talking it was coastal and then it started to move up the East Coast. There was an extension right here. This was due to cattle shipments where it got into um, Arkansas and, and then into Oklahoma uh, on cattle that were infested. And then it found some new habitat and it had some food. So now it had expanded into that. And where we have it now, uh, and this is my poorly drawn kind of looks like a turtle map, but it's been identified as being now in Ohio. It's around this range and it has been identified as extending up the coast all the way to Maine. So in 2017, there was a um, small ruminant producer that was going to uh, work with animals and went into the barn and I actually just learned a little bit more about the story. It was a it was a hair sheep named Hannah. And when the producer went to shear Hannah, they noticed that the, the, the animal was completely covered with ticks. And so they contacted their vet who then subsequently contacted the government because they were noticing some, some numbers and distribution and pattern on this animal, extraordinarily high numbers of ticks, and they were not able to identify that right away. So they sent that out to be identified. And what they found was we had an outbreak of the Asian longhorn tick, a tick that is, um, is endemic to East Asia. It's also in New Zealand and it's in Japan and all of that now. Um, and they've actually had problems with it for a long time over there for a hundred years. It's been around there for a while, but we had not had a big problem with that here. And that's it on the left. And compounding identification probably was the fact that it's just sort of a muddy brown tick and there are certain other muddy brown ticks that are out there that might be um, ticks that affect other species that we don't necessarily worry about as humans or the very common brown dog tick that we uh, will see in private practice occasionally um, that doesn't transmit a, a significant number of metal, medical diseases that we found at least here in Ohio. Um, but we have that here now. Unfortunately, it is now in 17 states from its New Jersey. It has expanded fairly rapidly over the last four years. We have this tick in three counties in Ohio now. Last year, it was identified in Gallia County on a dog that was surrendered to a rescue organization. And then earlier this year, it was found um, in Jackson County. And then recently here in July, I was contacted by a colleague of mine. He had contacted me. Um, he is a former extension agent and he wanted to talk about something he had noticed with ticks and the farmer across the street from him went out to work their animals and they found three dead animals. All three were full, full grown cattle and one of them was their bull. And when he told me that the animals were absolutely crawling with ticks to the point that they had filled the ear canals and they couldn't even see in the ears, um, that made me very suspicious because that behavior sounds like Asian longhorn ticks because they have an unbelievable ability to breed. And that's because their um, unusual reproductive activity includes what's known as parthenogenesis. And parthenogenesis means that the female does not need a male to breed. She can spontaneously lay eggs. She can lay thousands at a time over a period of a couple of weeks. And so what they found, and th this is a picture actually of a lint roller. They did a tick drag with a piece of felt and then they rolled it. And every little spot that you see here is a tick. There's a couple of adults, but you have a lot of, um, a, a lot of larval and nymphal ticks in this pasture. And estimates from my colleagues who did this tick drag was that this pasture had up into the millions of ticks. So this is a major problem we have with this one. Now, since it is a true invasive and it's not from here, we need to figure out, is there specific diseases that it will have the ability to vector here in the United States? And unfortunately, we um, got a positive on that. And in 2020, late 2019, it was confirmed that this tick can vector thyleria to livestock, which is a protozoal parasite um, that, that causes some problems sort of similar to malaria in humans, but it can, it can cause some significant disease in cattle. So now we have another thing to worry about with this true invasive. So researchers have started to model where can this tick establish a host range here in the United States based on where it lives 
in the original place that it comes from and where it is shown to be able to survive. And so the first model that I saw was um, this one and, and they were showing, and this is, you can see where positives were and these have simply expanded, but you'll notice that if you take a look at this map, this looks a lot like um, the maps that we looked at for American dog tick, for the Lone Star tick, for the deer tick, plus a coastal component over here. Uh, there's been a number of maps overlaid. This tick does like he um, heat and humidity pretty well, and it's it can uh, it can take it in the tropics. And so we have some serious worries that it's going to make its way down um, through a lot of other places. This is a overlap of three models where um, they where they agree has the colors closer to red so all the models that we look at seem to say that it's going to do pretty well in a good chunk of the eastern half of the united states especially um, in the southern part uh, some coastal area up there um, we'll have to see there are a lot of studies ongoing i um, part of some research and some projects here at ohio state where we are going to be looking to figure out exactly where this tick as well as the other ticks in ohio are in terms of numbers um, and what diseases they carry and, and what our concern is going to be about um, tick species in certain areas and diseases that they carry all right so now we got everybody um, hopefully at least mildly worried about ticks. Let's talk about how to keep yourself safe from ticks. So first thing I want to stress is ticks are a, um, you, you don't want to get bit by a tick ever if you can help it. They're a prevention disease. This is not one where you would say, I'll deal with it after I get it. You don't want to get bit by a tick at all because if they're embedded in there, you start the clock on them being able to transmit bacterial, viral, protozoal diseases, possibly have you um, be exposed by a allergic syndrome. If you do, however, have one embedded in you or in one of your animals, there is a correct way to remove that tick. You wanna take either a tick removal tool and there's lots of inexpensive ones out there or pointy tweezers. And the key is here, you need to get all the way down to the base of the skin because you need to get the entire head because you wanna get that mouth part up as well. Don't just grab it by the abdomen and yank. You'll probably yank that out of there because remember that is um, attached in there with barbs and it is um, not going to want to come out. You want gentle upward pressure getting all parts of the tick and then you want to wash that area, wash your hand and then save that tick for identification. You can put it in a plastic bag. So how do you prevent um, a tick attachment on bare skin? There are a number of repellents that are out there. Um, how do you protect yourself further? You can treat your clothing with permethrin. I use a combination of both of these to keep myself safe when I'm outside and I have any kind of concerns about ticks, which is just about any time I'm in a about any habitat, but permethrin treated clothing is pretty effective. I recommend long sleeves, long pants, light colors. Most ticks have at least some dark cutter color in their patternality and it's easier to identify them when they're crawling up you. Treat your shoes or your boots. Um, the nice thing about permethrin treated clothing that when you treat it yourself or when you purchase that clothing, it lasts for multiple washes. And, and like I said, you can treat it yourself, but if you don't wanna do that, any number of outfitters, just about all of them, at either online or in person, are going to sell now permethrin treated clothing. So make that part of your personal protective profile. And then there's a number of different topical repellents out there that you use on bare skin, but you, you wouldn't treat your clothing with. DEET, Picaridin, IR3535, and then there's a new chemical that was just um, uh, approved by the FDA called nucatone. And so all of these come in multiple different preparations. What I recommend you do is identify what's going to be best for your situation, how long you're going to be outside, if you're going to be swimming. Um, sometimes they might have sunscreen on them. At, with them, sometimes they have different listings for ticks versus mosquitoes. Um, sometimes they have different listings on what um, you know, what population would be able to actually use them, whether it's older or younger or things like that. So um, the pesticide educator in me tells folks, make sure to read, understand, and follow the label very carefully. The label is the law, and the label is going to have all the guidelines on that product that will allow you to make a, uh, a wise choice on what's going to be your best repellent to pair with your permethrin treated clothing. 
So I get a lot of questions also on how do I, how do I make my yard safer? Um, should I treat my yard? And, and there are a number of products that are out there. Some are able to be over the counter. Some are ones that you need to have a commercial applicator or a lawn care service do that. The important thing to remember is control of you know, pests needs what's known as an integrated pest management strategy. And what that means is you, you have to do a number of different things. It's not just simply relying on a pesticide to treat a pest. There's habitat modifications, there's understanding of feeding patterns and life cycle stages and, and all of the things that way. So what I recommend you do is make sure that you decrease the ticks preferred habitat in terms of removing leaf litter and, and clearing tall grasses and brush around homes. Um, you know, it may or may not be practical to put a wood chip barrier or gravel barrier, but that is something that quite honestly, they don't actually like to move um, over that. Mow your lawn frequently, meaning that if you have an overgrown lawn, we're finding that that is ideal tick habitat. And in fact, um, in the outbreak that we had in Monroe County, um, we had a very mature, maybe over mature pasture and, and that shady ideal tick habitat is what really allowed them to breed to those high levels layers. And then understand that ticks will feed on any number of different mammals. And so you might have some nuisance wildlife that comes into your yard and the ticks could be coming in on them. So we have several take homes that I want to stress here. And what that is, is one ticks and the diseases, their vectors they, they vector are prevention diseases. Ideally, you want to prevent tick bite and attachment because you want to prevent the potential chance that they're going to vector disease to you. And understand that while they do have preferred seasons and, and temperature ranges that they like to feed in, uh, if the conditions are correct, they can feed in all four seasons. And so you may encounter a tick at any time out there. Understand that our understanding of ticks, their host range expansion, what diseases they carry, all of that changes constantly. Um, we need to do more research. We are working on that right now, but there's a lot we need to learn. And the world of ticks and the diseases they vector, um, they change fairly com commonly. Know that there's both bacterial, viral, allergic, and protozoal potential complications from a tick uh, vectoring to the host, whether that is a human, um, companion animals, or your livestock. Have a personal protective plan for safety, and that includes permethrin treated clothing and repellents. That is tick checks. That is making sure that you, um, that you, once you get out of tick habitat, that you can throw your clothes in the dryer or wash them, or you can take a quick shower so that you rinse any ticks off before they attach. Make sure that you have your companion animals in your plan because ticks love to feed on them and, and your dogs and your cats don't self tick check. The nice thing about companion animals is quite honestly, probably our best um, tick protective pesticides uh, are all targeted to companion animals. And there's a number of different products out there. So work with your veterinarian to find out which one is gonna be best for you, your dog, your cat, and, and how they have their lifestyle familiarize yourself with the proper removal method that we talked about, and then save that tick for identification and even potential testing to see if there was disease present in that tick so that you would know about any potential um, disease concerns you may have so that you can co contact your healthcare professional as soon as possible. So learn more about ticks. There's great resources out there. We are expanding our resources here at The Ohio State University. We have a great fact sheet that talks about ticks. We're working on another fact sheet that will give more detail about the Asian longhorn tick. We have a number of different uh, research studies that are going on right now trying to figure out exactly what data we have and what data we need. Um, I really like the Tick Encounter website. That is University of Rhode Island. It has um, lots of great information on there where you can get your own great high-res pictures. You can click on how to treat your own clothes. You can find out what tick activity is going on, either where you're at or where you're going. And then I wanna thank everybody um, for this. My big take home point is, is make sure to keep yourself, your companion animals, your livestock and your family tick safe.